paper reports that two of the male prostitutes were given a late night tour of the White House last year. Greetings, everyone. Welcome to the Nick Bryant podcast. Today, my guest is Christina Radix Verum, and she's an independent journalist. And she's directing a documentary to be released next year called Kidnap and Kill, an FBI terror plot. Hey, Christina, how are you doing today? I'm good. Thank you so much for having me. My pleasure. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure. So I am an independent journalist and content creator. I live in Northern Virginia, and uh, I'm currently directing and producing the documentary Kidnap and Kill an FBI Terror Plot, which is based on the Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer kidnap plot case, which I'm sure everybody has heard of, uh, but maybe don't know the full details. Well, well tell us about the case give us an overview of the case as it was reported in the mainstream media yes so um these men uh, were arrested october of 2020 so if you go back in time to the election of 2020 as you know it was a contentious election these guys were arrested for quote unquote conspiring to kidnap whitmer and they're arrested one month before that election almost a month to the day before um, so this was something that was right all over the news, like global uh, headlines. Gretchen Whitmer talked about it, um, and she said that she, you know, she felt threatened. Uh, Joe Biden, Kamala Harris mentioned it. They uh, said that these were militia guys that were uh, activated by Trump because Trump had tweeted out "Liberate Michigan." And a few, he had mentioned a few other states. So they said, oh, these militia groups were radicalized by Trump and they were plotting to kidnap and, and kill governors. Uh, that is not the case at all. And what actually happened is the FBI infiltrated a pre existing group called the Wolverine Watchmen that wasn't even a militia group. Uh, the group was a small group in Jackson County, Michigan, of kind of like preppers. And then the FBI infiltrates the group through their informant, Dan Chapel, who rises to become the executive officer or second in command of the group. And he is effectively the leader. And he starts um, the group uh, doing tactical trainings, what they call FTXs or field training exercises. And essentially what the FBI does is they employ a network of 12 informants, uh, two to three undercover agents to kind of stitch together a group of people who were, lived in different states and didn't really know each other or have connections to each other, except through the government in order to, what I would say, orchestrate the appearance of a plot where none existed. So tell us about the defendants and how these FBI informants lassoed them. Yes, okay, so uh, I, this may be kind of all over the place because there's 14 different guys here um, and they broke the case into two different cases. So 14 men were arrested October of 2020. Six are charged at the federal level with conspiracy to kidnap Whitmer. And then they add a superseding indictment and they include uh, charges for WMDs. Um, the men, in, the eight men that were charged at the state level, they were charged with uh, what the government calls providing material support for terrorism. So they're saying that the eight men they charged at the state level provided material support to the men who they charged with conspiracy federally. So uh, 
Adam Fox was the the guy that the government called the ringleader of all of this. He uh, is he at that time that this happened. Adam had just gone through a divorce. He was living in the basement of a dilapidated vacuum repair shop called the Vac Shack. That um, he was working there as well. And he, you know, he's an indigent like person. He he wasn't even able to bathe there. He had to go to a Mexican restaurant if he needed to have water or like plumbing. Barry Croft was framed as the spiritual leader of the group, which I guess the government just made this up now. Apparently, you can now be the spiritual leader of a crime that didn't happen. Uh, he was a middle-aged truck driver from Delaware not even in Michigan, didn't even live in Michigan. What interest does he have in kidnapping Gretchen Whitmer? He was a father of three. Um, uh, the other, Brandon Caserta, he was a young machinist from Detroit, Michigan. Daniel Harris, he was charged at the federal level. He is a 24-year-old Marine who served our country with dignity and honor and was then pursued by our government and framed as a uh, DT, um, Pete Musico, loving father, Joe Morrison was his son-in-law. Um, they're just working class people from Michigan. Eric Mulder, same thing. He's a father of two. He was working security uh, as a security guard. And then the Null brothers, Bill and Michael Null, they're twins. They're also fathers, business owners. They had uh, been in militia groups for a long time. They worked security and provided event security for uh, Whitmer's political opponents. So there seems to be a political aspect to this, but really these guys are just working class people from kind of like the middle of nowhere, rural Michigan. And tell us about Dan Chappell how he fits into this. So Dan Chappell uh, was one of the main informants that the government used to pursue and create this case. He uh, is an Iraq war veteran. That actually is true. But in this case, he the way he portrayed himself to these defendants who he uh, entrapped, he kind of presented himself as like an operator, you know, like a war hero. And um, really, he, he became the glue that kind of held all these people to get, he's the one, him and the other informant, Steve Robeson, who basically introduced these guys together and created the events where they would meet. Like without these informants, these men don't even meet each other. There's no plot without them. In every overt act that is named in the criminal complaint, every time when you look into the discovery and the actual evidence, it is uh, the informants who are pushing for those things. And they're trying to induce the targets to go along with it, but there's no actual agreement for anything. And uh, Dan originally hooked up with some of these guys on Facebook. Yeah, that's correct. So the story that we get uh, for how Dan Chappell became an informant in the first place is very strange, and I don't believe it's the truth. However, some of the discovery is still sealed, and I don't know that we'll ever get uh, access to it or be able to get the answers. However, we can put some things together from what we've seen from other documents relating to the other informant. So Dan uh, claims that he was just looking on Facebook. He happened to be interested in finding uh, pro 2A groups. And he claims that the Facebook algorithm recommended the Wolverine Watchmen Facebook group to him to join. Now, at that time, there was only 15 members of the group, and it's a private Facebook page. The idea that he organically came across it looking for pro 2A groups is ludicrous. Um, there are groups that are thousand member open public facing pages that aren't private, tiny pages, but he claims that he saw it, he joins the group, and then he said that he saw uh, threats of violence against law enforcement. He just so happens to be friends with a gentleman named Detective Ramirez, who was on the Michigan State Police Task Force with the FBI, their violent gang task force. And we are told within two weeks, he becomes an informant for the FBI. Now, those initial threats of violence against law enforcement that he claims he saw in the Wolverine Watchmen private group chat, there's no evidence that they exist. 
No screenshots have been provided. They didn't collect that evidence, apparently. So we believe believe that this is a cover story, but Facebook plays a major role in the case because throughout the course of the investigation, the FBI is using it because they're creating fake militia groups. They're putting their informants at, as the heads of different state chapters of these fake militia groups. Uh, the FBI uses what they have as uh, is called a online covert employee or an OCE. So these are FBI employees, agents, who are, um, they're running fake personas on Facebook. They're posing as regular people and with the goal of getting people to join these FBI run Facebook pages. So that's how Dan joins the group allegedly and that's how he becomes an informant. And we know their other informant, Steve Robeson, he claims he became an informant in October of 2019 because he said he heard threats of violence against law enforcement amongst three percenter groups. He heard chatter. Again, there's no substantiation of these vague threats he claims he heard. Uh, but so he, we know from his um, things we've seen relating to his case, the FBI claims that they gave him uh, access to a database of Americans they wanted to target. This is how he knew what people to target online and how they knew to introduce the defendants to each other, how they found them. So we can infer that if they're giving access to Robeson to this database, that they probably did the same thing with Dan Chappell. And uh, Mark Zuckerberg, the uh, CEO of Meta, testified before the Senate, and he talked about his good deeds in helping capture these dangerous individuals. Yeah, that was interesting. Uh, he testifies October, I believe, 28th of 2020. It was right around the time these men had been arrested, like the same month they were arrested. He's bragging uh, to the Senate committee about the role that Facebook played, uh, they said, and getting the signals of whatever it is they claim they heard in the Whitmer case to law enforcement. And he boasted that uh, Facebook had worked with the FBI for about six months prior to that. So that lines up with March of 2020 when Dan Chappell uh, first joins the Wolverine Watchmen Facebook page and then basically becomes the de facto leader of the group. It's interesting. Mark's building a big compound in Hawaii right now. And he's going to have a lot of security. And that just might be because he's made some people angry. Isn't that interesting? Poor Mark. It's, <laughs> he's, he's got a tough life. I mean. Imagine being these men, though. And like, here's the, the, the head of Meta, right? Uh, which encompasses Facebook, WhatsApp, Instagram. Like, there's a powerful guy that is the head of numerous big tech platforms. And here he is bragging to a government committee about how he worked with the FBI so they could target and entrap you. It's amazing. So this case included uh, 12 defendants and two were acquitted. Tell us about the two that were acquitted. Uh, so five in total have been acquitted. Uh, two were acquitted five. in the federal case. Yes. Yeah, so uh, the first two people who were acquitted, um, so at the first federal trial, uh, there were six men charged. Now, what's interesting about what happened is initially when all of these men were arrested, this is going to be a long answer, by the way, but I promise I'll get to your question. When they're arrested, uh, they're, they all told the same story that there wasn't a plot to kidnap anybody and they didn't know anything about a plot. But the it seems like the FBI, they they knew that they they, I don't think they wanted to take this to trial. I think they assumed all of these men would take plea deals because they were facing basically life in prison. They're, you know, none of them could afford their own lawyers. Like all these people got public defenders, right? So they got uh, two people to cave and to take plea deals. Um, one of whom I think that, and I'll just say this is speculation. I believe the first man who took a plea deal, Ty Garbin, may have been an informant the entire time. The reason I say this is because we don't know the identities of all 12 of the informants. We know the identities of six of them. We don't know all of them. 
he was arrested in January of 2021. Very so this is before even all the discovery is in. He gets a private attorney, Mark Sautua, who used to work for the FBI, and he takes this uh, sweetheart plea deal. And then right before the trial, month before the trial, they pressure Caleb Franks into taking a plea deal. So they got two people to take plea deals at the first trial. It results in zero convictions. Brandon Caserta is acquitted. Daniel Harris is acquitted. Adam and Barry, the, the two people that the government called the ringleaders, a mistrial is declared to them. So that first trial got zero convictions for the government and two acquittals, and they were very upset with that. So they retried Adam and Barry in, in what amounted to a show trial. They have been uh, convicted. They're appealing their convictions, but Daniel Harris... He, like I said, was a 24-year-old Marine. He was held, you know, imprisoned for 18 months while he had a hip injury, and he was waiting to get surgery on his hip. Um, you know, these are these people didn't do anything wrong. Brandon was a machinist from Detroit. He was acquitted, and the other three men who were acquitted were charged with providing material support. So Eric Molitor. Uh, the FBI alleged that he went on a daytime recon of the governor's vacation cottage where the FBI planned the daytime recon and were driving the vehicle and paid for the gas. And they lured people out under false pretenses and they didn't know what they were going for. Nobody knew they were going on a recon, right? Like Eric didn't know that. Uh, he was acquitted. So, and then the Null brothers, the same thing, like they were charged with providing material support because they got lured into going on a nighttime recon. This also like the daytime recon planned by the FBI. The FBI was driving the vehicles. So that's five acquittals from two different juries. And their attorneys, from what I understand, used the entrapment defense, which is really tough to improve, uh, to prove entrapment. Yeah, uh, the government has like a, um, I think it's like a 99% conviction rate. And to meet the elements of entrapment, it's very hard to mount a legal entrapment defense. You have to show that you had no predisposition and you have to prove that you were induced to do something that you would not otherwise have done. Uh, they did argue entrapment. However, uh, at every trial, federal and state trial, both all of the judges put uh, impositions on what they were allowed to argue. Like at the last state trial for the last three men, uh, Eric Mulliter and the Null brothers, Judge Hamlin ruled that the, the defense were, they were not allowed to use entrapment as a defense. They weren't even allowed to utter the word entrapment. They could mention certain elements of it, but what they the jury was prevented from hearing that, right? So these guys did mount an entrapment defense, but they were hamstrung in what they were allowed to say, what evidence they were allowed to present, um, and even with that, we've got five acquittals from two different juries. So you've got this huge case where these right wing militia are going to kidnap the governor of Michigan. And the feds take the first shot at them. And they indict six, right? Yep. And ultimately, two make plea deals and four are acquitted. Two are acquitted federally and then three at the state level. Oh, so three, Adam three and Barry, state. yeah, okay. that were uh, charged federally as the ringleaders. They're currently sitting in supermax prison appealing their convictions. And what is really egregious about that, at that first federal trial, Judge Yonker had made um, rulings about what he called hearsay statements, which is... Things that the informants said on the wires, right, where the informants were talking about kidnapping the governor, where it's the informants that are asking, getting people drunk and stoned and asking them hypotheticals. The judge ruled that statements that the informants made on audio was hearsay and couldn't be played to the jury, but they could take out the th the little cherry pick the things that the defendants said in that same recording that could be played to the jury over and over again. So there were these rulings that were made that prevented the jury from even being able to see a lot of this evidence. 
Uh, I think it's ridiculous to call something hearsay when somebody is on audio recorded saying it and you're playing clips from the same recording of other people. It's disgusting, quite frankly. So they didn't have a, a fair uh, trial. Like if you can't present the evidence of your innocence and how somebody is uh, setting you up, like you're not getting a fair trial. It's interesting. I was in the Supermax prison once. Um not as an inmate, but as a journalist. And um, and it's burrowed deep into the mountains. It's called the, uh, the Rock of the Rockies. And I was there to interview uh, Anthony Gaspipe Casso, the former acting boss of the Lucchese crime family. And what I found interesting about that prison, everybody is in solitary at that prison. And your yard, in your yard time, you're still in solitary. They give you a little uh, plexiglass cubicles about the size of your cell. And uh, gas pipe had yard time at the same time with the Unabomber, Ted Kaczynski. And Ted would do laps in his little plexiglass uh, cell outside. And uh, gas pipe was a, was a little perplexed about that. But that was a very strange day. And I will say one thing about that prison. It was immaculately clean. But I don't think there was an ounce of compassion rolling around anywhere in that prison. So the state trials. Tell us, tell us about these state trials. Yeah, I I want to focus on that for a second because I feel like when this case happened, everybody's familiar more with the federal case and those six men, and it, and they waited until they did the retrial of Adam and Barry. They put off these state cases. I mean, this last one we just had in November, or I'm sorry, September of this year. You know, they put it off that much, um, and so the state trials. Uh, they those men were charged with providing material support some of them got a felony firearms and you say well what does that mean providing material support for terrorism well it means that the fbi can create a fake militia group and then they the fbi can use their informants to uh, invite a bunch of people to an ftx that the fbi pays for and sponsors and provides all of the equipment to while telling these men that they're giving them defensive firearms and medical training and if you happen to lend your property for an ftx you know because that's what they were doing the as these agents were uh, these informants or whatever you want to call them, agents provocateur working at the behest of the government as they were posing as sort of like state heads of state chapters of various militia groups, they were asking people to, you know, come to these FTXs or to help out. They tried to get people to get involved in doing the trainings or whatever. So they would ask people, hey, can we, you have property, you've got an acre of land, let us host one of these FTXs on your property. Well, if you let them host a training on your property or a meeting, the FBI can now charge you with providing material support for terrorism, even though it's the FBI hosting the FTX. <laughs> It's a government hosted and sponsored event. So, but that's what they did. They charged these guys with providing material support to a terrorist act, which they claim was the conspiracy to kidnap Whitmer. So for the Null brothers, they said that the way that they provided material support was that they provided personnel to what they called Adams Militia Group. Now, let me back up and explain what that means. Adams Militia Group doesn't exist. It's an FBI fabrication. What happened was their informant, Steve Robeson, who is a career criminal, who is a multiple time felon going back decades. This man is a convicted uh, pedophile. OK, um, he worked uh, for the FBI previously with biker gangs in the 80s. So he's worked as an informant before. Uh, he was posing as a national leader in a uh, fake militia group that the FBI created called the Patriot Three Percenters. So he's posing as the, he's the head of the Wisconsin chapter. They have their other informant, CHS Jenny Plunk, posing as the head of the Tennessee chapter. And Steve Robeson tells Adam Fox, who the government frames as the ringleader here, he says to Adam, I'm going to induct you into this group, the 
Patriot 3%er United States National Militia Group, which completely is an FBI fabrication and doesn't exist. He inducts him as the head of the Michigan chapter. He says, you now have, you're the head of the Michigan chapter of the Patriot 3%ers, and now you need to recruit people into your militia group. So who's all members of Adams Group? It's all FBI informants. Dan Chappell is inducted as the commanding officer. Adams' friend Sean Fix, who was pretending to be a, a Navy SEAL at the time that would have access to Blackhawks and Hueys, he's inducted as the executive officer and everybody else in the group is all FBI informants. So <laughs> and it's it's stunning. So give us, delineate the charges at the state trial and, and tell us what ultimately, how that adjudicated. So the at the federal trial, it was, cons the, their men were charged with conspiracy to kidnap Whitmer. There was a superseding uh, indictment added of weapons of mass destruction that was applied to some of the federal defendants, not all of them. And then for the state guys, it was providing material support um, they also uh, categorized the Wolverine Watchmen. They classified them as a gang. So some of the state guys were charged with gang membership. Um, it's very strange. The government has said that if you have five or more people and you all have similar values or beliefs or ideologies, you're now a gang and they can now use um, law enforcement tools that are for gangs you know the gang task forces like they can use that to go after you so these guys were charged with providing material support felony firearms you know like a, oh you had a gun on you while you provided material support and to, to the support you provided was you taught somebody how to tie a tourniquet at an ftx that the fbi sponsored you hosted a medical training so what the government is alleging is that when they were hosting these ftx's that was all government sponsored they claimed that th these guys were doing offensive firearms training. That, you know, they were planning to to kidnap Whitmer. They alleged that they were essentially practicing to take out her security detail. That's not true at all. When you actually look at what they were being taught at the FTXs, uh, they they love to show this footage of the guys going through a shoot house. This is the other ridiculous aspect of this. The government says these guys were very dangerous, right? Not only were they planning to kidnap and possibly kill Whitmer, they actually alleged in their absurd hysterical complaint that these guys from Jackson County in like Munith, Michigan, in the middle of nowhere, that they were going to start a civil war and overthrow the government. Um, they said they said that they were uh, going to try to ignite the boogaloo. I don't know if you've heard that term. It's like a, another FBI fabrication. None of this was true. What, what so, is the boogaloo? <laughs> the boogaloo is a term that I think that initially you the boogaloo movement was basically a group of kind of like liberty loving or more libertarian Americans, people that aren't left or right. They're not ideal ideological, but they didn't like the tyranny that was happening, especially during 2020 with the lockdown mandates. As you know, Gretchen Whitmer had uh, the most strict lockdown in all of the country, which she was so proud about and bragged about. So you had a lot of people from both sides that were kind of coming together in opposition of these things. And then it turned into like a meme of they were saying like Civil War II electric boogaloo as like a meme of you have a bunch of guys that think they're in firearms culture and they kind of have this, what do they call them? Like a chaos fantasies where they kind of think that, oh, in, in this scenario, like a shit, it's the fan scenario, you know, there, if there's something like this, then we can uh, like re we can fix the country or they have this notion that there will be a conflict and then, oh, everything can be, put back together and, and then we'll have we'll go back to having the constitution it's like a silly meme um but basically what they were saying is they thought a civil conflict was inevitable they were looking at the trends and they thought that's what would happen now the government turned it around they it put all of their informants you know in hawaiian shirts to try to make this like these people were wanting to make a civil war happening rather than what they were saying is if this happens and we think it's inevitable, this is what we should do. They were trying to, I guess, prepare for that type of scenario. 
but according to the government, they wanted to instigate it, a civil war. But that's not true. When you look at like the the context of people who call themselves boogaloos or whatever and what they were talking about online at that time, it was just a bunch of people who thought something bad was going to happen. And it looked like they kind of wanted to prep for if this scenario happens and you're in basically lawlessness, right? That's what it was about, Anarchy. from what I understand. Anarchy. Yes, yeah, they were. They thought something like that was going to happen, and it was going to be inevitable, and they wanted to make sure they were prepared to defend themselves and their families, right? Kind of like, For a situation uh, Charles, like that. Charles Manson and Helter Skelter. <laughs> yeah, well, the, exactly, right? Where the government says that you want to make this happen, and you want people to fight or whatever they they basically come up with a caricature of what they called white supremacist like militias that wanted to storm capitals and you know execute governors that none of this is true like i have in the documents here these informants were trying to bring together people from 15 different states to create a multi-state terror plot that the fbi just couldn't get off the ground so there are many people and a lot a lot of folks don't know this i don't want to say the full story because i want people to have a reason to watch my documentary right but i can tell you that this they wanted it to be where the fbi was trying to get numerous people to like agree to a plot to kidnap governors or to storm state capitals. So one of their informants uh, targeted a man named Frank Butler, who is an elderly uh, disabled Vietnam veteran who lives in my state, Virginia. So their informant, Dan Chappell, is trying to convince him to uh, kidnap and kill Ralph Northam. And if you go on my website, I have a quote from one of the lead handling FBI agents on the case. We got text messages from, not all of them, right? Some of the text messages we got in Discovery show the handling agents talking to their informants. And a special agent, Jason Chamber, says to the informant, Dan Chappell, mission is to kill the governor specifically. <laughs> He's, that's the FBI telling their informant what the mission in plan is. He literally says mission is to kill the governor specifically. He tells the informant to tell Frank Butler to kidnap and kill Ralph Northam. This is when Ralph Northam was our governor. And I'm going to just uh, read something for you real quick, if you don't mind. I have it uh, right here. Go for it. So this is um, what I have here is the discovery from the discovery this is things the informants were saying on audio that the defense wanted to be able to play for the jury to show hey wait you need to hear the context of this because what the government did was they would set up these meetings and then they'd invite the guys to the meetings they give them alcohol and marijuana and then they would ask them like hypothetical questions and remember the context of this it's the summer of 2020 when there are riots happening across the country cities are being looted uh, businesses are being um looted and like communities are being attacked and these are men who are wanting to learn how to like defend their communities and there's anger about potential vaccine mandates and lockdowns like these people can't work they can't earn a living so the fbi is like okay let's call a nationwide meetup of militia groups they call and share uh something that they called their national militia meetup which they again this is something that is an overt act in the criminal complaint the government claims Barry called and shared this meeting. That's not true. Their informant, Steve Robeson, called and shared the meeting, and they won't produce the receipt of who booked that conference room at the Drury Inn in Columbus, Ohio, because they know it's Steve Robeson's credit card. Okay, that came out basically at trial. So here's the government calling and sharing a nationwide meetup of militia groups called and shared by the FBI informant and pedophile Steve Robeson. And then there's five other informants present, all recording. Everybody else invited to this national militia meetup are targets, people the FBI is targeting. These are where, like Adam and Barry have never met each other before, but the government invites them to this meeting in, in Ohio and introduces them to each other. So you cannot have this case without the like the government made this happen these men wouldn't have met without the fbi introducing them to each other but for uh, like i said there are many people who are called 
unindicted co-conspirators. There's over 20 of them, people who just got duped into going to one of these meetings or they got invited to going to a meeting. People like Frank Butler, veterans that were targeted. Um, I'm going to read to you here. This is something that uh, Steve was saying to, um, let me see if this is the right one. Steve. Steve, the uh, informant, Steve Robeson. Okay. So he was trying to set up uh, Frank Butler, a, a disabled Vietnam veteran from Virginia, to kidnap and kill Ralph Northam. Before he did that, though, he was telling him that he was the gonna governor be, of Virginia. Yeah, he was telling uh, Frank that Frank was going to be the head of the like state of Virginia. Again, this is an FBI informant telling the target of their investigation, this elderly disabled. Uh, 60 year old Vietnam veteran that he's going to be the head of the Virginia chapter of a fake national three percenter militia group. And this is what the informant uh, Steve Robeson says. This is at one of the meetings that, again, the FBI uh, set up. Um, so Steve, CHS Steve tells Frank Butler that if they don't have objectives at this next meeting, he's done having meetings. CHS Steve tells the other informant, CHS Jenny and Frank Butler. So you've got a target of the FBI's investigation, and he's got two informants working him. He says, quote, if we don't talk about actually doing what the F we need to be doing, I am done with meetings. Frank, Frank Butler, the target, asks CHS Steve if he's building an army in Virginia, to which CHS Steve replies, absolutely. Frank Butler asks CHS Steve if uh, he's going to build that army and he can be part of it. He tells Frank Butler, you are building a forward unit. F what? And he says, one that will be ready to go and go do whatever it is. If it ends up being an army with different effing company units, then so be it. Better to it. But right now, you want to have effing 20, 25 people that at the effing drop of a hat, you can assemble, travel, or resource. So this is the informant, Steve, pushing people towards taking offensive action, telling them that they're going to be heads of state chapters of fake militia groups and encouraging them to recruit as many as 20 to 25 people to have a QRF, a quick reaction force. I know that this is something you've heard a lot if you paid attention to the January 6 cases, uh, the Oath Keepers case specifically. Members of the Oath Keepers were charged with seditious conspiracy. Part of that involved a quick reaction force where it was a bunch of people that were just got a hotel room in Virginia where you're allowed to carry firearms and they left their firearms at this hotel. They did not bring them into D.C. because legal you're not allowed but the government said well you had a quick reaction force with with guns stationed there right ready to go at the drop of a hat this language is repeated here in the whitmer case they were trying to do the same thing they were trying to encourage a disabled veteran to create a forward operating unit and the well, qrf very, so they could then charge him with it you're very passionate about this case what's what's driving you to expose this Oh, I just, uh, I don't like corruption. And when it's so egregious like this, when I can literally go look and I can read through time after time after time, every single thing in here that is an instigation or a provocation is the federal government. And then all of the exculpatory information, I have the, the guys in here, these defendants saying things like, you know, we're not offensive, we're defensive. We're not black bagging politicians. We're, nobody's interested in, like, they're shooting it down every time. But yet they're still charged and they're still convicted. Five men are still in prison right now. That's why I'm angry and passionate about it. And I'm not going to stop until those men are free. It's, it's ridiculous, first of all, that five are acquitted, but we still have five in jail. It is now at this point recognized what happened and widely so. So are you, uh, your political views, are they right or left or are your political views influencing your passion here? Um, I would say not really. Like as far as politics goes, I am registered as a Republican, but I don't necessarily consider myself 
left wing or right wing, right? Like I used to be a Democrat, you know, I actually campaigned for Obama back when I was like 17 years old. And, you know, I, I don't know. Um, but I, th I look at politicians and I just see it as a uniparty, right? Like you're just two different wings of the same corrupt bird. So in my opinion, I'm an American and I believe in the constitution and I believe in what our founding fathers uh, said. And so I'm passionate about that and restoring that. Um, I'm passionate about injustice in the legal system. I think, you know, I, I worked as a paralegal for many years um, and I don't like to see, I've seen that machine, right? And how inhuman it is and how disgusting it is. And I've seen what a scam and racket it is. Uh, and I think that if you haven't been, like if you haven't seen it from the inside, you probably don't know. There are many people who go about their day every single day, not knowing that if you get on the wrong side of the government, if you do something they don't like, they can go after you with the full pressure of the world's most powerful empire. They can and they will. They can manufacture crimes where none existed. There's a book called Three Felonies a Day that was written by a former federal prosecutor that says, there's so many like redundant laws on the books that if they want to get you for something, they'll find something. And basically you walk outside your door every day, there's something you're doing where they can find a felony charge for you. And they it, three felonies a day, you know, you can, and they, they can indict a ham sandwich. I know everyone has heard that before. There's truth to that. I, I've often said that about grand juries. I wrote a book called The Franklin Scandal in which the FBI covered up uh, a nation mild wide child trafficking network. And I've also been, I've, 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 over the years, I've seen tremendous malfeasance by the FBI. What intrigued me about your upcoming film was you get into PatCon, uh, which is Patriot Conspiracy. That's a program by the FBI to go after people on the right. And the FBI in the uh, 60s and 70s had a program called COINTELPRO that primarily focused on people on the left. And although it was unmasked during the Church Commission in the mid 70s, no one went to prison for it. And uh, this is what the Church Commission concluded about COINTELPRO. The government operating primarily through secret informants, but also through other intrusive techniques such as wiretaps, microphone bugs, surreptitious mail opening, and break-ins has swept in vast amounts of information about the personal lives, views, and associations of, uh, uh, of, and associations of American citizens. Groups and individuals have been harassed and disrupted because of their political views and their lifestyles. Investigations have been based on vague standards whose breath made excessive co collection inevitable. Unsavory and vicious tactics have been employed, including anonymous attempts to break up marriages, disrupt meetings, ostracize persons from their professions, and provoke target groups into rivalries that might result in deaths. And COINTELPRO also included legal harassment, intimidation, uh, infiltration, smear campaigns, and blackmail and the suborning of perjury. And a number of people uh, died because of COINTELPRO. Um, the FBI informants would penetrate like the American Indian Movement or the Black Panthers, and they would put in someone's mind that such and such was an informant. And the people in that group would kill them. And it it's it, it happened innumerable times. So there's a writer named uh, Trevor Aronson, and he has written a book called Terror Factory: Inside the FBI's Manufactured War on Terrorism. And he says that it's 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 a very good book. And actually, he's written a number of articles for Mother Jones uh, pertaining to the subject. He says that there are roughly 10 times as many confidential informants in the FBI's network now as there were at the peak of COINTELPRO. And for each of the 15,000 registered informants, there are as many as three unofficial ones. So... So we've got a lot of FBI informants running around. And 
he talks about the pressure that can be put on people to become informants. Uh, he talks about people being put on a no-fly list if they refuse to become informants. I, granted, they have not committed crimes, but the FBI wants them to become informants. And the FBI pays these informants substantial sums, um, up to uh, $100,000 per job. $100,000. So if you're an informant and you entrap someone and set them up, you can make $100,000. So being an informant can be extremely lucrative. And um, the FBI's current counterterrorism, counterintelligence budget is more than $3.8 billion, which raises concerns about the extent of these taxpayer dollars are spent orchestrating the very plots they are intended to thwart. So tell us, give us an overview about PatCon, because what you're talking about, this kidnapping plot emerged out of PatCon. Yeah, uh, exactly. Well, you mentioned COINTELPRO, and you described and read from like all the different uh, tactics that the FBI was using at that time. And you mentioned how, you know, since then, th this has only expanded, right? Their informant program. Um, I believe when Trevor Aronson was writing about uh, when he wrote his book, The Terror Factory, in 2012, the, those were the figures then, and I'm sure it has gone up since then. Uh, there was a recent report that um, mentioned that the FBI spends around $530 million annually on these informants and paying them, so I think it's a lot more than um, the 15000 and maybe two to three unofficially for that. I think it's probably more than that, and I think that's terrifying because I think about like the the Stasi and how they utilize the citizenry to spy on other citizens. And I feel like we're in that territory with what is going on here. Uh, the informant Dan Chapel was paid almost $60,000 in envelopes of cash for six, seven months work. So PatCon, um, very similar to COINTELPRO, but it, it allegedly began in the um the 90s it may go back to the 80s we don't have a lot of documentation on it like there was from cointel pro and part of the reason for that is because there there hasn't been an actual church committee since uh this since it's the church began. committee <laughs> yeah right exactly uh, you could i i mean we could have a weaponization committee but i've been very disappointed in them um, and so it, PatCon was basically COINTELPRO, but aimed at the right. They were targeting groups that they called right-wing, Christian, militia, um, white supremacist groups. And uh, I, what happened is I believe most of those cases did not end up in prosecution. So it's not like you're getting access to discovery to really get information about this. When you look at the methodology of what the FBI is doing and how they're doing, it is the exact same disruption tactics that they were doing against anti-war left-wing activists in the 60s. It's the same type of thing that they were doing. Uh, as you say, they will um, They'll infiltrate groups. They'll try to turn people again. They do very disgusting things. They try to radicalize people and, um, you know, steer them into committing terrorist acts. So then the FBI can come in and then foil the plot and get the accolades uh, and expand their budget and their influence. And we know, um, according to some of the uh, recent FBI whistleblowers, that the FBI has financial quotas attached to this to the agents as well. They get bonuses. They have quotas they have to meet, though, um, for quote unquote domestic terrorism cases. Uh, Steve Friend, one of the um, FBI whistleblowers, has talked about how they were inflating the numbers using January 6 cases and spreading them out across the country to make it look like, oh, there's been this drastic uh, uptick in domestic terrorism in the United States. So now we need more money and more resources and we have to take away more of your rights. It is I can disgusting. remember reading about these cases um, some years ago after 9-11. Uh, and some of them just disintegrated. And the people, some of the people that were set up had IQs below 90. And yes. I thought to myself, if you've got an IQ below 90 and you seemingly type something subversive on social media 
you might be in for some trouble and um because some of the people that the fbi set up at least back then were cognitively challenged let me just put it as diplomatically as possible cognitively challenged or and, you could say emotionally vulnerable and emotionally vulnerable and there was a woman named uh, Wendy Painting who wrote a uh, doctoral thesis in 2016 called Aberration in the Heartland of the Real. And uh, she talks about the feds in a way that is pretty amazing. And her doctoral thesis was approved. But this is a quote from her doctoral thesis. In attempts to prove that they were not feds, PatCon agents and informants set about successfully arranging the theft, often from military bases, sale and purchase of related contraband, mostly weapons, but sometimes explosives. So you've got PatCon agents stealing weapons and explosives from military bases to show that they're not law enforcement. That's, to me, pretty mind-boggling. Yeah, that's right. But, you you know, you have um, some of these informants on the books, people like Whitey Bulger that were going out and murdering their competition with the full knowledge of the FBI. Uh, and they they knew about it. They let that happen. Yeah, this is par for the course for them. PatCon was ostensibly uh, started in 1991. And there was a Newsweek article, article about PatCon. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, yes, um, the Newsweek article, I forget the name of the journalist who put it out there I've, in 2007. This was the first time, from what I understand, that they mentioned the name, the word PatCon. Uh, and this is where we got a lot of the information about PatCon and those quotes from John Matthews about how the FBI has, you know, the Ruby Ridge, Oklahoma City, Waco being all PatCon operations and that the PACCON operations were still ongoing. And this article, although it was heavily edited. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. Cer certainly indicated that there was a program called PATCON. Yes. That's right. And not only that, but some of the things that were in that article, um, if I remember correctly, showed that the FBI had, uh, they had a name for like a program they had to kind of create um, sources. Like they had, they were recruiting sources in the media and they had like a, a word for their program. I forget what it's called, but it was also disclosed in that article, which I found fascinating. I read a couple of books recently. One is called Revolution's End. And it was about the Symbionese Liberation Army, which was a far left-wing group that kidnapped Patty Hearst. And actually it was put together in Vacaville prison where mind control experiments were being conducted. And this might sound out there, but it's all true. Um, Donald DeFries, Patty Hearst and other radicals, left-wing radicals would visit Vacaville prison. And because we wondered why did the Symbionese Liberation Army and Donald DeFries kidnap Patty Hearst, the daughter of the uh, pub major publisher. And actually uh, at Vacaville, these prisoners were allowed to have conjugal visits with these young radical women. And Donald DeFries and Patty Hearst had a number of conjugal visits. And ultimately, Patty Hearst dumped him. So that's why he kidnapped her. But what's really interesting is you get into the Symbionese Liberation Army, and it was put together by the CIA. And they looked for black guys to basically run it, to be the head of it. And three black, and all these guys were in prison. And three black guys decided that they wouldn't do it. So they ultimately, uh, whoever they is at the uh, at that level of intelligence, ultimately installed Donald DeFries. And he was an, an informant. So he was very pliable. He could be leveraged. Whereas these other three that were conscripted to run the Symbionese Liberation Army were not. 
And there's a very good book, and it's gotten very popular. It's called Chaos, and it's written by Tom O'Neill. And he talks about the reason why the Sabinian's Liberation Army was formed is that it was it was hoped that it would infiltrate left wing groups. And wow. and in chaos, Tom O'Neill put something forward very forward uh, about the Manson family and and Manson's connection to um, intelligence and law enforcement. And he spent 20 years on that book. And I'm really glad that he's that he's had a lot of success with it. But uh, Manson, his parole officer, he, Manson was, well, he was on federal parole. He was busted, um, molesting minors, and uh, the law enforcement knew that he was trafficking drugs and arms, and, and nothing happened to him. Nothing yeah. happened to him. And his parole officer was in San Francisco. And actually, Manson was the only client of this particular parole officer who <laughs> was a CIA asset. How convenient. So, yeah. <laughs> so, so, I mean, and what I have just said to you about the Symbionese Liberation Army and Charles Manson um, sounds completely uh, out there and fabricated. But two very good books that authors have spent multiple years on prove what I have just said. So I would suggest to people that they read Revolution's End and Chaos and also check out Christina's movie when it comes out. Oh, thank you so much. And uh, read um, Dr. Wendy Painting's book as well, Aberration in the Heartland of the Real. Highly recommend it. Well, Christine, thank you for um, joining me as a guest on the Nick Bryant podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. And have yourself a great day. You too.